probably as well armed with information as, as what you're going to find. Well, Jim, we're still gaining a few people, but we're getting pretty close to launch at this stage of the game, and uh, we will be ready to uh, to rock and roll here. We will, like you know, all our extension meetings, as our gentlemen know, that uh, we're on our 2009 dairy days. We start on time, we end on time, so we really want to respect uh, your your time commitments as well. So <clears throat> we're just about ready to to launch here, are we not, Jim? And according to my watch, I've got about a minute to go. Uh, and uh, we had close to 150 people indicating interest in signing up for it. Uh, some of the locations have more than one people added. A couple of universities indicated they were going to pull in. I know one feed company was thinking also of utilizing the information. So anyway, we'll uh, we will uh, see where it goes um, goes from there. Our our list just keeps keeps getting um, longer, and that's that's exciting to see. Anyway. Uh, the good news, Jim, the price is right. Uh, to be honest with you, we, we're kind of hoping that maybe the webinar is a, a method that we might explore even further here in the future. And as all of you are well aware, uh, state budgets, certainly at Illinois, and extension budgets are really, really tight. And at some point, this may go cost recovery, and so, which means there will be a fee attached to this. So uh, be thinking about that. In fact, Jim, there will be a survey at the end, I believe, that's going to ask that question. Is it not? Um, we don't ask this time. This time we're not going to ask, Jim said. But the question is, do you see value in this? And at some time in the future, maybe it'll be Dave's um, uh, webinar, we'll ask, you know, would you pay a dollar for this? Would you pay five dollars for or something like that? But at this point, we're just trying to get our feet wet, and, and hopefully we don't have too many glitches today, Jim. This is our first launch. We have our IT group here. Uh, Jim Balls leads that group there and has put Leoma's efforts into this, along with uh, uh, Luann Wilcox and Jan, uh, Jen Roth. Uh, they're all players in this one as well. Well. And um, then, of course, online you'll hear Dave Fisher a bit later and Dick Wallace. And so they'll be part of this as a resource people. They have microphones turned on. So if we have a, a specific health question, uh, Dr. Wallace would be a very logical uh, person to take a look at it. If we've got some questions in terms of uh, forages and, 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 and facilities and things like that, then obviously Dave Fisher would be a logical choice. And, uh, of course, you can also type in answers and questions and comments as we go along as well. So I think we're ready to load, are we not, uh, at this point, Jim? And we want to welcome everybody to this, uh, the first University of Illinois uh, dairy webinar, co-sponsored with Dairy XNet. At this point, our topic is uh, feeding challenges with today's milk prices. And we all know it's a pretty hot topic, at least here in the United States. I think our Canadian colleagues are have to feel a little bit more reassured. I'm not sure about our colleagues in China and places like that. We have several different countries represented here today, and so hopefully you will find, find value for that. I'll be driving the PowerPoints here today, and as we mentioned earlier, we are going to have a second one, and uh, you'll see this at the end of the program as well, but we thought we'd just indicate that we'd like to try this again, and so you can see the, the date, the time, the players listed up there, and there's the registration URL that if you are so motivated, you need to click on that, just like you did for this one here today. So let's go ahead and move on if we can and uh, get into this and and uh, this little time says economic expectations and maybe the word should be survival at this stage of the game. Notice the word profit doesn't pop up here because most dairymen now in the Midwest and the U.S. see no profit at all. The bad news, milk prices dropped five dollars per hundredweight in some areas even higher than that because of their of their blend prices. Uh, the good news, uh, feed prices have also dropped somewhat from where we were back at seven dollar a bushel corn and uh, some of these higher feed prices so there's a little bit of help there as well. If you're milking less than about 130 cows, the, the milk program, this is the milk income loss uh, uh, a program that's done by the government is now available. You'll see that will help us out a little bit. And the bad news is, and we saw this, uh, in fact, the good news in Illinois, it's, uh, if you want to call that good news, certain situation, about $100 per month is what we're looking at, kind of a loss. Uh, the folks out in uh, New Mexico, Arizona, I last week said that number is closer to $150 per cow per month, and there's some liquidation going on at this stage of the game. I'm going to my next PowerPoint that looks at, well, one of the questions we have, well, when might this thing turn around? And, and folks, there, there really is some pretty good news on that one, to be very honest. We'll update that on for you right now. 
the first quarter, these were the projections uh, uh, just literally a week ago in the first quarter of 2009. Uh, this is class three milk, just be well aware. And we won't get into the details on that, but uh, for us in Illinois, we'll probably put a dollar to a dollar and a half to two dollars on top of that, depending on the blend price and the differential and some of the quality premiums and milk components. The second quarter, 1124, the good news is we just found this yesterday, the milk went up max, went up as max level. And those of you who want to go online right now, we now have in May, June, and July, as of today, we're looking at uh, almost twelve and a half to thirteen dollar melt. So the second quarter could be up a dollar and a half. The fourth quarter is all over sixteen. The fourth quarter is all over sixteen. So that's kind of exciting news at this point. And along with sixteen thousand cows that left the dairy industry here in uh, in February. So certainly things are happening out there on the farm. We did mention briefly, as we talked about surviving in these times, uh, again, in the U.S., this is your deficiency payments. Uh, again, it only counts for your first 2.9 million pounds of milk, but the February price was $1.63. If we, if we look forward, that price is almost going to be $2 in March, uh, at least the projections, if you, if you look uh, look ahead, that's what the tables are showing, $1.93 in March, $1.60 in, in April. So anyway, uh, that's another factor that will come into play. And certainly, uh, if, uh, if you're a dairy farmer here, you certainly want to be aware of this program, regardless of your herd size, because it looks like the next two or three months. What's the good news on this chart? It's, it looks like in September, that number gets very low, which means price of milk is coming up. Well, what are we going to talk about then? I, I thought we just set the stage a little bit to kind of give an idea where the prices are, when they might change, what are some of the strategies. And of course, one of the questions all of us would like to have answered from the three of us, and that is, well, where can I find that $5 per 100 weight? And more specifically, how, what changes can I make to save $5 per 100 weight? And unfortunately, there is one right answer there, Jim. The answer is don't feed your cows. If you don't feed your cows, you're going to save about five dollars, five and a half, six dollars per hundredweight. I think there's some negative downside to that, but at least there's your academic answer you have. So what I'm going to go through are these three points: uh, feed benchmarking, uh, the three golden rules, and then alternatives. And Dave and Dick will come in and be players in that portion of the program as well. So let's start going through what I call uh, feed benchmarking. I put this up to say this came from our Illinois Dairy Days back in January and, and some, some focus meetings in February in Illinois and, and farmers are making decisions. Bankers are forcing farmers to make decisions. Farmers are asking nutritionists and veterinarians to make changes as well. All these are pretty scary. All these have been told and the one that really scares me is two bankers have told their PD people you will feed only what's on the farm which means corn and forages and that has some serious ramifications as well. Well let's go look at this economic benchmarking. We'll go through this modestly fast but every dairy farmer, every consultant, every uh, um, individual has this type of a budget. This is Illinois. We'll be very clear at times the data is very biased, it's very specifically laid out. But this says pretty much today what does it cost to put groceries in front of our girls? And you can see we broke it down into six different categories. I go right up front and say I'm going to pay somebody 10 cents a cow to, to do, the, do the work. That may include balanced ration, balancing rations, interpreting forage test results, maybe spotting good feed buys and things like that. So here you can see here's that magic 50 pounds of dry matter. It cost me four dollars and forty cents. Now let's go to the next one, and this is the one you want to circle or go back to or write down quickly. Here's where you're going to get your grades. See that top number? There's that $4.40. It then generates these next four benchmarks. The first one is feed cost per pound of dry matter. That's nine cents. If you can feed cows for nine cents per pound of dry matter here in the Midwest, when I were out in Arizona about a month ago, that is two cents higher. Two cents a pound dry matter higher. Well, those 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 folks are now looking at another extra dollar in feed cost that luckily we here in Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa don't face as far as that goes. So nine cents becomes an A. Feed cost per hundred weight of milk. Notice that sits somewhere around six dollars to six and a half dollars to seven dollars. What do you have to see? 
you have to see those cows that produce more milk and that same feedstuff produces it cheaper. So anytime you start messing with milk yield, then be well aware you're going to start playing the game of losing some of these benchmark numbers. So I'm saying if you can feed your cows for 650 per underweight, here in the Midwest you're doing a very nice job. Uh, or, and, and if you get it down below six, more power to you. Income over feed costs actually gets outdated every every day, and, and and so some people love this figure. I don't use it very much because I can't control the price of my milk, and that drives this number. I mean, a year ago at this time, this number looked a lot better, and you as a producer had nothing to impact it. So, but you do impact feed cost per pound of dry matter, feed cost per pound of weight of milk, and then the last one is feed efficiency. And this one is getting lots of traction now. Feed efficiency. Suddenly dairy farmers are interested, consultants are interested in saying, maybe that's important to know how much milk do I get from each pound of dry matter. Your A, 1.5. So if you've got feed efficiency over 1.5, you're doing an awfully good job. You're doing a really good job. Why is that important? All I did is took a cow herd, a, 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 a string of cows giving 70 pounds of milk at 9 cents a pound of dry matter. And if I can support that 70 pounds of milk with 50 pounds of dry matter versus 44 pounds of dry matter, that savings is 56 cents a cow a day. Huge number. That's a huge number. I would argue if you were in a room in my lecture with me today, either in class or in, in, at a conference, all of us should be able to find 50 cents a day. If, if this, if after the seminar is over, you haven't found 50 cents, then Dave Fisher and Dick Wallace and Mike Hutchins hasn't done a very good job. Because I would argue all of you should be able to get somewhere between 1.5 and 1.6 by doing some rather interesting strategic things that we'll touch on here very briefly. So that's a powerful power point where feed efficiency says it's a critical, critical number. Now, if you don't think it varies, this is a very busy slide. In fact, Jim Ender has put this slide together, and it just shows about six or seven different farms here in Illinois collected in January of 2009. Guys and gals, these are pretty good farms. Notice the, uh, the yellow number, that's the low ball number. The blue number is the high number. And, and just, just, look, just look at the differences on the bottom three numbers on feed costs. We, we see some herds uh, sitting down here at feed costs as low as $5.41. Now, that's a high group TMR. Now, notice that's also the most expensive cost per pound of dry matter. Don't you miss that. In other words, this dairyman has got a very good ration put together, very expensive ration, but his cows understand that. Uh, and so they respond very well. So there's a one group versus a high group versus a low group. We'll touch on that very briefly. Remember this slide. But look at over here on feed efficiency. One of my herds, 1.4. Most of my herds are sitting around 1.55, 1.61. I just show this to say all these herds are in Illinois. In most cases, they're almost living within a 20, 30 mile radius of where our meeting was being held over at Freeport. So it's it just some amazing data. So let's look at the bottom line as we finish up here. And this comes from uh, Bruce Jones, Dr. Bruce Jones at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this came out of one of his publications several months ago. And he said, here are three of the big items. And he's got feed costs and he's got a range. Most of my Illinois guys are going to be on the right side. I've got an Illinois herd probably that's going to be on the left side. He's milking uh, either 1,200 or 3,000 cows. So certainly it makes a difference. Feed costs, non-feed costs, labor costs. In fact, Dave Fisher and a colleague down in, 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 uh, in his area down there work these numbers and they come out almost identically coming at a little different direction. The point simply is notice that top line, no debt payment, no return on assets, no return on management skills or salary. But simply says we probably need in Illinois somewhere around 1550 for milk to cover everything and you can see some of these other farms can get around $11.50, $12. They can survive at least covering these costs as well. So that's another question that's been raised by some of our students that is, well, where, where do we have to be to cover costs? That's why I'm pretty excited this morning to see that actually you could lock in $16 milk for the last three months of, uh, of, of this year. And of course, you could actually contract your milk. Now the question, are you going to do that? Oh, that's another question for another story, or we can do that on Q&A. Okay, that takes part, takes part, takes care of the first third of the presentation. Some what I call benchmarks, numbers, comparisons. How competitive are you at? What do you have to have? And where's your profit margin going to start to occur? I'm not going to my second part, and every time you see these Jersey cows, it simply says we're changing a topic or an emphasis. So it kind of keeps you with me as we go through this through the webinar. 
wow, webinars are deadly. They can really be tough because uh, there's no way to read faces and see people are saying, what is this guy talking about? So let's go through these golden rules. We'll go through modestly fast. If you read a couple of your farm magazines, these have been picked up at a couple of different sources. These are golden rules that simply say, number one, I, I never give up milk. And, and this, I, if you're a banker, get your ears on. If you're a consultant, get your ears on. If you're a dairy farmer having a hard time paying bills, you got, you just got to live with that. And the reason is that I bring up at this point a, a useful guideline, and, and it simply says if we look at dry matter, that means the groceries that feed the cow versus what she's going to produce in milk sales. The thumb rule for jerseys is two pounds of milk per pound of dry matter. Actually, Holstein's about two and a half, but let's just say two because it's easy to see. So most dairy cows should give you for that extra pound of dry matter or that pound of dry matter you take away, that's going to cost you two pounds of milk. So if milk is sitting at $12, and we're looking at a two to one ratio, it simply says, I'm gonna put nine cents in the front of my hand of my Jersey cow, I'm gonna get 24 cents back, or 30 cents back. And I'm simply saying that's an awfully nice trade. That's an awfully good trade. So I gotta be very, very, very careful when I start pulling back that's gonna affect milk yield and milk performance as far as that goes. Now the next line simply say, yes, let's do some shopping. Here are three different energy sources. And what we calculated out was the cost per mcal of energy. Uh, could be a pound of TDN, uh, whichever numbers you like to work with. If you're uh, if, if you're in, in in France, it could be metabolizable energy. So it depends what country you're in, what system you work with. The point is very simple. You can see those numbers, and the answer is the cheapest source of energy on these feeds would be corn silage. Now, recently, there's a new winner in Illinois. It's called wet gluten feed. And we're seeing prices of uh, wet gluten feed somewhere around $60 a ton. And wet gluten feed are, is a tremendous, tremendously good energy source. So yes, I'm saying don't cut back on energies. The question is, are you buying the most economical sources of energy? Same thing would apply to forages, would apply to protein supplements, would apply to byproduct feeds. The question is, don't cut them on nutrients, but are you getting best bang for your dollar. Golden rule number two follows golden rule number one. It simply says that most of us, unless you're living in Florida or Georgia or some of those other milk markets, we are paid on pounds of components. And this is fairly sobering. You'll notice that just, uh, just about a year ago at this time, and by the way, that's 2009. My Hutchins is not a very good typist up there. You want to make a mental note of that. 2009, a milk fat is, uh, and that's the last uh, numbers I have because the March numbers aren't out. We're still in March. A dollar nine for milk fat, and that should be a dollar ninety-two. This is a wonderful slide, Jim. I did a wonderful job. Uh, spell check doesn't catch some of those things. That protein price is a dollar ninety-two. A dollar ninety-two. Uh, outside of that, it looks really good, doesn't it? Of course, the milk price would be somewhere around twelve dollars. Outside of that, all those numbers look really good. Just to make sure people are on top of things here. The point, though, is simply is that uh, milk components have value. And that's another number to take a look at. So rather than dwell on these wonderful numbers, James is rapidly making corrections here, let's look at and simply say, well, are you getting your cows to get their genetic potential out of them? This comes out of Hordes Dairymen. Every year they put their DHIR. These are the, the, the basically the registered breeders here in the United States. They get, they get these rather exact uh, high-tech records. <clears throat> and basically what it says, that if I've got Holstein cows in the United States, these cows on DHIR tests in the United States average about a 3.6 to 3.7. And the true protein, those of you in Canada, you've got to put two tenths on top of that. Most of those of you in China, you've got to put two tenths on top of this. In Europe, you've got to put two tenths because what we report in the U.S. is true protein because that's what drives cheese yield. So we're not paying you for NPN. So that's why be a little bit careful. Some of you that don't live in the U.S., your numbers are going to be two tenths of a point higher than we have on the screen here. So the point is, if I got Holstein cows and they're giving me a 2.8 true protein test, then we would ask you're leaving some money on the table. Why aren't your Holstein cows producing the components? Because we just saw on the last slide, those components have value, and we've got to get those corrected out there as well. The third golden rule is one that really scares me. Of all the ones I've seen, this is the one that's causing me the most concern, and that is long term. Long term, people say, well, you know, I've got to get to July, 
So I'm not going to use AI. I'm not going to use my consultant. I'm not going to use the veterinarian. Well, let's go to the nutrition side of this and simply says, you know, long term, if you're going to be out of the dairy business in two or three months, then you can do anything you want. But if you're going to be back at a webinar a year from now with us, then I'm simply saying, Certainly, we got to get animals calving, and so when we start pulling out minerals and vitamins from heifers, they are going to slow down in growth, and you can see what that cost is. Now, the good news is you don't pay that out of your checkbook. The problem is two years from now, that uh, those heifers aren't going to be there. Accelerated calf program, some controversy on this point, but the Drakeley work and the New York work would indicate about 1,000 pounds more milk because of the accelerated high-protein diets fed in the first five or six weeks. That's going to cost you $50, and that's your problem. I got to pay $50 in March to recoup something way back two years from now that may give me a thousand pounds more milk that's going to be worth, you know, $110 or, or to make to make life simple, or hopefully even more than that. Uh, Dave Fisher will talk more about this in his uh, in his uh, webinar here in a couple of weeks. Getting cows pregnant. This is Wisconsin data. We got open days, anything more than 120 days, two dollars a day. Uh, they say over uh, for over 200 days, that's eight dollars. So there, there's a there's a curvilinear response that says the longer these cows aren't pregnant, the more money you lose because they don't come in as fresh cows. Wisconsin somatic cell count, and then of course from California lame cows. So if you're not hoof trimming, you're not paying attention to those kinds of things. Uh, another six pounds of milk. Again, you never see that running down the d down down the, uh, the milk. Parlor, it's just that the cow doesn't produce. These are scary ones. These are really scary ones because people are, I'm calling, really jeopardizing long-term impactors. So the point is, if you make a change today or last week or last month, then the cows are going to respond. And these are all different types of cow responses that you and I might see out there. Milk urea nitrogen. If it changes by more than three units, I'll just read the first one. The rest you can read yourself. But it simply says, if your months, milk reunited changes by two to three units, then something has happened on the cow. So in the normal range, I expect to see the months would be somewhere between eight and 12. So you elect to pull out something out of your diet, and the months go up to 14. Wow, something has happened. You, in other words, the cow is now telling you, whatever you did, it, it's impacted her 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 utilization of protein in the diet and that applies to all those other factors listed on your screen here today as well and we were in fact we really covered the bottom three in some of our other golden rules so cows always talk cows respond uh, eyes wide open and listen to them because they will probably give you some feedback as well I'm now moving on to the last phase, and we're in pretty good shape time-wise, actually. The last phase simply says, okay, what are some things that we should be thinking about and talking about once we said, I'm not going to violate the golden rules. I understand there's some economic benchmarks on the feed side we've got to be aware of. I understand the price of milk, at least in the U.S., looks like it's coming back up. At least it is for, for this Friday at this stage of the game. What are some things we can look at that we can kind of cheat? So, yep, I'm going to cheat. I've, I've, it's been a really tough two months for those of us in extension because uh, farmers are saying, Mike, I, I, I just can't pay the bills anymore. I've got, to, I've got to make some adjustments. So here we go. We're going to let you do some cheating, but be careful. Don't let you violate my golden rules. We're going to look at starch. And we've got one PowerPoint on most of these, and then Dave will come back on forage quality a bit later. So we, we learned some neat lessons a year ago when we had $7 a bushel corn. We discovered we don't have to feed 30% starch, and there's some other strategies out there as listed here. Uh, rumenzin, reducing fecal starch losses, looking at rumen, fermentable carbohydrates, and byproduct feeds. So we're saying all of you in this line should know pretty much what is your starch levels in your feeding programs. The low number is 19 comes from the Minard Institute. And they, they, they've actually cranked this number down by using higher levels of corn size, some unique other feedstuffs to get that job done. But we're saying you don't need to be at 30, 31, 32, 33 percent starch. So maybe there's an opportunity to reduce some of that input cost as far as that goes. Let's go to the next PowerPoint then and say, well, is the corn really working for you? This data simply says how you process corn. And I know we have one company online here today that has steam flake corn. Uh, you can see that has a higher energy value than, say, a cracked corn. Some of you online have high moisture corn. That will feed hotter than dry corn, assuming that it's at least 26% moisture. 
So you could see an orange. Uh, that was supposed to be because Illinois won their basketball game last night. They did not. So, Jim, we probably should have put those all in black today. But anyway, you'll have to read. But the point simply says is that that corn, how you process it, how you handle it, how you ensile it makes a real difference. Now, for a dairy farmer, if you look at some work from Penn State and from Farmland Industries, the difference between the top corn and the bottom corn in a, in a mid-lactation cow is six pounds of milk. So I can support six pounds more milk because you and I have processed the corn to make the starch more available in the rumen to optimize rumen fermentation and microbial growth. So that's a take-home message. Now, as some of you are saying, well, I grind my corn on the farm. Here's your action item. Sneak out after the seminar is over. Don't let your wife or spouse catch you. And take a cup of corn and put it through your flour sifter and see how much goes through your flour sifter. If it's dry corn, two-thirds of it should go through the flour sifter. Now, you can also send a sample to a commercial lab, and they'll give you those exact numbers listed on this slide. But these are some things you can consider and look at out there on your dairy farm. Another one is to make sure we process our corn silage properly. This is some work done by Joe Harrison. He looked at all the published studies, and there are two or three take-home messages. Uh, published studies means that good research in a journal of dairy science or animal science. Notice the response there is around two pounds of 3,5 fat corrected milk, because generally speaking, butter fat test was higher, and we saw some more milk. But look up there. Have you noticed under that 1.1 pounds of milk, there's a minus and there's a plus. So obviously, some corn was processed more optimally or correctly than others. So the answer is, did you do it right? We're basically saying, I don't need to see the kernels. I like to not really crack them. I want to hammer those dudes so I get rid of the, uh, so I expose that starch here in the rumen of, of, of the animal and the small intestine. And you can also see some other advantages as well. So the question is, have you looked at your corn silage? Have you seen kernels in it? Uh, do you have the three-quarter inch theoretical length of chop to maintain good rumen mat and good rumen function? So just because we've processed the corn doesn't mean that we've got it done right. Now, there's nothing I can do about that here in February and March, but once a, that's a take-home message. Another one is rumenzin. Let's look at the bottom one. If you look at the research, 300 milligrams of rumenzin replaces about a pound and a half of corn. That rumenzin will cost you two or three cents. So there are not many places in the United States you can buy a pound and a half of corn for two or three cents. There's no way you're going to get there. And so there's another strategy. According to Horge Dairyman survey in 2008, about 22% of our farmers reported they were feeding rumenzin. Boy, there, there sits an opportunity. Now, notice, look at the levels we can feed. And you can see it can vary all the way from about 120 milligrams up to 660. So certainly you have to ask, do I have the optimal level? And you and I are probably going to monitor such things as manure consistency and butterfat tests to try to get a handle on that. I know Dick Wallace told me here at the University of Illinois uh, yesterday in class, we're feeding about 325. We're like everybody else. We started at 275, 280, and Dick has raised that up gradually because our cows appear to handle the higher levels of rumenzin and because the response in terms of feed efficiency and impact is linear as long as the rumen can handle those higher levels of, of uh, rumenzin or monenzin, whichever name you want to use. Another one is to steal some of that uh, starch out of the manure. This is some work from Jim Ferguson's lab out of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this represents about 18 or 20 herds, about 75 groups of cows. I talked to Jim about a couple months ago. He said they've actually expanded this. And what you see here is how much starch there is in the manure. And now your commercial labs for $13 to $15 can calculate, excuse me, can measure fecal starches. And on the right, on the vertical axis, you're going to see something called apparent digestibility of starch. So that 0.8 is 80% utilization, 0.9 is 90% utilization, 100. That means that all the starch there is, is theoretically going to be consumed. Notice we don't get much higher than about 95, 96%. There's always going to be some starch that gets through for, for various reasons because of a biological system of, of the cow and her rates of passive digestive tract. But look at that, guys and gal. Some of these cows, some of these groups of cows are sitting at 8% starch, 10% starch. Dave Lighty at Illinois did a study on this for me last summer, and the range in Illinois was 4 to 10%. So the question is, so what? And the so what answer sits right here, the two bullet items. 
let's take the second one first. If you can reduce fecal starch by one unit, in other words, go from 6% to 5%, 9% to 8%, Jim Ferguson says that represents about 7 tenths of a pound of milk. Kelly, I think that's a pretty good idea. I'm going to take starch out of the manure, which I don't get paid for, and end up letting the cow make more milk out of it. Sounds like a no-brainer to me at this stage of the game. Notice he also says that we should be at least at 90% starch digestibility, which means you should be something less than five. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave Fisher knows some of these herds. I think we had three or four herds out of our 19 that met this criteria. So as we would say, there are opportunities. And again, I'm not charging you more cost, perhaps, to get this done. Then we're going to go to the next one, feed additives. And let me tell you, these are being jerked out a mile a minute. And so what I did is I put together two lists. The first one is what I call a no-brainer. And this was questions at our focus group and says, well, Hutchins, I'm only going to pick one or two. I can't buy all these. So these are my magic ones. And in fact, uh, Dick Wallace's class actually ranked these yesterday. The number one was Rumenzin. And I tell you, the vet students got it right. So in my view, I'm going to rank these for you. I would put Rumenzin number one. I would probably put Silage Inoculants number two. And that's going to be a tough one because you don't sell corn silage. You only reap that advantage of these sides is once you feed it. Rumen buffers and yeast culture as 3-4, organic trace minerals, and then biotin. So that's how I would, I, would, I would rank them out. And we could spend a whole seminar, or webinar, I guess I should say, on this whole list. And if you're interested, Jim is going to survey you. If you want to do that sometime in the future, we'd love to come back and do a, do a webinar on feed additives. Which one, how much, and why would you use it? Now, I also have a second list, and notice the title change on this. It says additives as needed. So these are ones that I'm saying are special needs. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, if I've got body condition score 375 cows, a little pudgy suckers, then rumen protected niacin goes right into the diet. If I have fatty liver diagnosed by my veterinarian or lots of ketosis, then rumen protected choline would come into place. If I'm going to drench cows at calving to try to get blood glucose levels up to reduce ketone production, then propylene glycol becomes a very favorite product. If I'm going to be finding moles in my feedstuffs, then a mycotoxin binder can be a very effective product as far as that goes. In July, my feed gets hot in the bunk. I may put an acid, in this case a propionic diacetate, acetate preservative, in with my feed to keep it from getting hot so the cows will eat more of it. So these are as needed. So you may need them in summer, you may need them for fresh cows, you may need them for fat cows, and you try to target them because I'm not sure I can justify selling it to you for every cow in your herd at, uh, let's say, on uh, the 20th of March. The next Jersey cow pops up and it says, well, okay, we talked about additives, and I think I've got that sorted out. I hope I have. What about byproducts? And now this is Illinois again, so be very careful. I'm looking at my list of people, and they're from all over at this stage of the game. Here, here we can see uh, a list. And let me tell you what I've done, and then you know what? I'm going to let you read it. And again, Jim Baltz is showing you where you can find this. Uh, these are all loaded online, and Jim will come back and show that at the end of the seminar or in the Q&A period. But let's just read this. Uh, let, let's, let's pick on the bottom one, distiller's grains, because that's the hot one. Distiller's grains, it's in yellow, which means in Illinois, that's a good buy. The next column, the next one says 10 to 15 percent of the ration dry matter. So if the cows are eating 50 pounds of dry matter, you could add five to seven and a half pounds of dried distillers grains or wet distillers grains dry matter equivalent. Now the question is, why is that range? The answer is, how much oil do you have in your distillers grains? If it's under 12 percent oil, then you can go higher because that oil tends to be a risk factor in high-producing dairy cow rations. If it's a low oil, if it's a low, whoop, I got that backwards, Jim. If it's a high oil, I can only go 10%. If it's a low oil, I, I, I can go as high as 15%. Dakota Gold, some of you in the Midwest will recognize that name. Dakota Gold is probably the Cadillac in, in, in distillers' grains. They control the amino acid profile. They control the variability. They control the oil. So it becomes a very good product. Got to pay a little bit more for it usually, but by and large, you can push it at a little higher level. Then in yellow down there, fighting a lot of line of yellow down there, we ran this through feed valve, feed valve 3, University of Wisconsin. Some of you out there may use sesame. That's the Ohio State program. The break-even price, $2.98 a ton. The price that we saw, and then this was a month ago, $162. Now, lo and behold, I just got my cheat sheet in here. It came in the mail this morning. And here in eastern Corn Belt and in Iowa, 
115 to 125 a ton. Wow, they're almost giving the stuff away. So it simply says that in this time of tight economics, distillers, grains, wet brewers, and of course you've got to be living fairly close to St. Louis, at least in Illinois, or close to Milwaukee, or close to La Crosse, if you're from the northern parts of the state, they're a very good buy. You're not going to you're not going to carry water very far because the price of diesel and gas is going back up. Corn gluten feed, a very good price, and that price I've seen now drop down to a hundred dollars. And in fact, uh, I had a, a, from one of our shippers here in Illinois, you could lock in through August. Just eighty-five dollars, eighty-five dollars a ton. Now that's FOB, so you got to get it to your farm. But there's some real opportunities out there. Fuzzy cotton seed, uh, the newest price I uh, just got in, basically Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, uh, northern Iowa, two forty a ton. 240 a ton. So you can see while they're not giving the stuff away, it's a pretty good deal. Southern Illinois, Dave, at one of our focus groups we had just a week ago, uh, two, uh, 214 delivered in. Wow, and I know Dr. Wallace, you've been looking at that as well. So again, here's another opportunity to look at. Are you using some of these, what I call very, very competitive nutrient sources out there in your feeding program? Well, let's look at another one. This is called Waybacks. Waybacks is what the cow doesn't eat. Shrink, something that blows away, the birds eat, the rain spoils, whatever the case is going to be. Well, here's a huge, huge list, huge list. And I'm only going to pick out about two of these. The first one's the big one. Historically, we have recommended 2 to 4% way back. Basically, we're saying get that down below 2%. And if you're a really good feed bunk manager, go to the empty bunk. Uh, Dick mentioned yesterday in class that here at the University of Illinois, in a group of 100 cows, they are taking away 50 pounds of wet feed total from 100 cows. That means uh, they're, they're, they've got about 2 pounds uh, two, two pounds, excuse me, half a pound, a half a pound away back, half a pound away back, and that's west. So that's a quarter of a pound. So basically, they're almost at zero. But what are they doing? Fresh feed as soon as they come out of the parlor. They're not running out of feed until about 20 minutes, half an hour before they're going into the parlor. So they're really managing the bunk. Second bullet point says if you're over 4 to 5 percent, you can't feed it to steers, you can't feed it to older heifers. It's too valuable. It is too valuable. You've got to go back to cows with it. For example, Gold Fair Oaks, several, a couple years ago, Dr. Gordy Jones said they feed to a 7% way back in their high string. They pick up their way back and they then use that as an ingredient in their low cow string. And since they don't sort it, there's lots of way back there, it's a very predictable product, almost as predictable as corn silage or soybean meal or any other ingredient you'd have on the farm. And then they feed that almost to an empty bunk. So you know that's a strategy as well. Make sure the cows don't sort it. Make sure you clean out the bunks. There's all these tricks of the trade that says you want to manage waybacks, but we've changed our numbers. Yep, we'd say two to four is good. In fact, if you come to the University of Illinois, Dr. Wallace manages our herd. They have to feed to a 10% way back because that's what it's called ad lib. Ad lib, free choice, all the cow can eat. And so basically now what they're doing is how do we manipulate to try to reduce that in the non-research cows. Another one is going to be one group versus multiple TMRs. And we've changed our answer. And let's look at uh, an example and then we'll discuss that. What I did is I went to Spartan 2. Uh, this is a least cost computer program out of Michigan, out of Michigan State. And I looked at two different rations. I looked at an 80 pound TMR and a 60 pound TMR and said, what's, what's the trade off here guys and gals? The 80 pound TMR, there is no there is no megalac in here, there is no additives in here, there's no bypass protein in here, it is corn, corn silage, soybean meal, and alfalfa forage. It could be hay haylage, doesn't make patch but make a difference, it's alfalfa forage. And we put the prices in, typical prices, in fact Dave will show you those prices here in just a few minutes, and you can see here, uh, to feed 80 pounds of milk, it should take about 52 pounds of dry matter, and that cost is 11.8 cents per pound of dry matter, that cost is $6.15 per cow. Very similar to what we saw a bit earlier in our benchmarking. The 60 pound TMR, down to 490, 490. Notice the, the 45 pounds of dry matter, and I've dropped the penny per pound of dry matter off because I can use more forages in this feeding program. Now remember, I don't have any of those expensive additives or those other bells and whistles in here. So then I go to my next PowerPoint, and it says, okay, what's the saving? Just looking at the savings per cow per day, a dollar and a quarter. Holy smokers, huge, huge. But remember, they're going to eat about six and a half pounds less dry matter. 
So I'm going to I'm going to take that away because the cows won't eat as much of it. So I'm taking 6.7 pounds of dry matter away from that dollar 25, and I was going to use a high TMR because that's what we're looking at. That's about 80 cents a day. So that's the good news. They don't eat as much, so that helps me out. They're still 45, 46 cents laying on the table. Now here comes your big question. And you talk about an argument out of Reno, this one was hot. And that says, when I move a cow from the high group to the low group, does she drop in milk? And if she does, how much and how long? Uh, our university data shows a two-pound drop. Uh, this is some work done uh, that Travis Michael sent to us. Another research study says five or six pounds. Another study says two to four percent. So you talk about a critical number because you can see if I drop four pounds of milk when I switch these cows because they interact, they fight, they don't eat as much dry matter, and they never come back, they don't come back, then that's going to cost me 40 cents. So my dollar twenty-five I served, saved, I'm down to six cents. I'm down to six cents. But I think I'm going to recommend that we look at multiple groups because remember, many of my fresh cows are going to have some added fat. They're going to have some bypass protein in there. They're probably going to have buffer in there. They're going to have maybe some organic trace minerals in there for reproduction. Some of you may have some PUFAs, some polyunsaturated fatty acids for reproduction in there. So I'm saying we're going to look at multiple groups. And uh, we're looking at like high, low, uh, a thin cow, fat cow group. Uh, heifers are. To me, if you've got a heifer group and a high group, it's all the same. They're going to get the same rash. I'm looking at these different groups. But here comes the controversy. One farmer says, well, should I leave my mastitis group, my staph group, and combine them with, with clean cows? I don't think I'm going to do that. So here sits a farmer because of, of mastitis or because of, uh, of, of uh, reproduction. In other words, he's got a bullpen. So he says, i got all my pregnant cows in one pen, and the cows I want exposed to the bull in another pen. Well, you got to push a pencil on that one as well. So this is not a very clean one, but something that you and I need to think about when we look at one group versus two groups as far as that goes. My last PowerPoint is fats and oils, and all we're simply saying is you got to make a decision. you got to make a decision when you're going to use it. I'm using 70 pounds of 4% fat corrected milk. So any cow that's giving me about 2 or 3 quarters pounds of milk fat, I'm going to add oil. Oils are expensive, fuzzy cotton seeds, soybeans, megalac, organic uh, tallow, whatever you want to call it, they're there. So at some point, I'm going to add that, and I'm going to bring it up to about 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 of the ration. I'm going to add 2 to 3% from either oil seeds or distillers grains, first choice, animal fats, my second choice, my inner fats, the third choice. If you're feeding distillers grains, extruded soybeans, a half a pound of those fats or oils, I should say, is all I'm going to go with. Otherwise, we can bugger up the rumen as far as that goes. And then my strategies on the rumen inner fats, I would be like your Mega Lex, your Energy Booster 100. I would see them as an add-on, primary to improve reproduction, reduce body weight loss, to prevent ketosis, keep my cows in pretty good health shape at this stage of the game. I go to my next PowerPoint, and Dave Fisher, I think we've got you turned on. Dave Fisher from Edwardsville is going to cover these next couple of PowerPoints. So, David, uh, I'll turn the program over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mike, and certainly I appreciate the opportunity to visit a bit about uh, the role of corn silage and, and forages in the, in the ration, and we'll go with our next slide to begin the discussion. Certainly, we often hear and understand that forages are the foundation of the total dairy feeding program. And I suggest that corn silage should be the foundation of that forage portion of the feeding program. And I say that because we have seen many herds work very well with a high level of corn silage in the diet. What level should that be? I suggest that perhaps a a ratio of two-thirds corn silage and one-third alfalfa on a, on a dry matter basis really fits well for high-producing dairy cows because of the need for that high energy feed while still maintaining adequate fiber levels. Matter of fact, I believe uh, Dr. Wallace and Dick could comment later, uh, the U of I heard he has them at about two-thirds, one-third. The portion of corn silage to alfalfa also, though, will be influenced by other feedstuffs or byproducts. And I think Mike mentioned that uh, earlier in his discussion about byproducts and how they can fit in, in reducing the cost of the ration. So certainly, again, we're going to take into consideration the byproducts in the diet and basing that on the quality of our harvested forages, we now have a chance to, to really build a really neat ration. In order to do that, we have to evaluate the quality. And a lot of times people say, well, it looks good, it smells good, the cows are eating, uh, but they really don't have a good handle. So 
we suggest again that uh, you need to use some good tools. The the newer test that came out a few years ago, the NDF digestibility test, uh, uh, really is a great tool, and that helps to determine uh, which forage or which specific variety will be better in my ration to provide the needed energy to the diet. So again, that NDF digestibility, that in vitro test, many laboratories are doing that, and we like to see corn silage greater than 57% NDF digestibility, and that's on the 48-hour test, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A if we want to. Also, we look at different types of uh, varieties or different types of, of corn silages, and such as the role of, of BMR, brown midrib, and we like to suggest here again, too, we're looking for high-quality forages, and brown midriff corn silage brings that to the table because of the low lignin, high digestibility. And we could also get into the starch numbers and things of that nature as well. One thing that we always have to remember, if we would, and that is strategic use of those forages. And I, by that I'm saying we really have to take a look at how do we position those to the various animals uh, that we feed? For example, heifer versus a dry cow or high, high cow versus low cow in, in the lactation. My, my final point then is because of that importance to position the feeds to meet the animal needs, we really also need to understand the importance to position the forages to meet the challenges of lowering the feed cost. And here again, corn silage fits that role. The next slide then gives us a bit of a demonstration or uh, a chance to make some assumptions and compare how our forage costs will come out. We're going to take a 1,350-pound Holstein cow, 80 pounds of milk uh, in a positive energy uh, uh, state. Using alfalfa hay at $100, $180 a ton, corn silage at $45 a ton, and you can read the grain, corn, shelled corn, 450, soybean meal, 300. Now, I understand that these prices will vary from place to place, but the point is those numbers uh, represent what's showing up now in the slide, economics of the corn silage. We took the Spartan 2 program to do a comparison of the corn silage at various levels of the feeding program. And as we start to look at this and compare, it's pretty easy to see as we increase corn silage in the diet, we decrease the total feed cost to the cow. If we look at the, the zero of corn silage, all alfalfa hay diet, that gets to be the most costly. And if we go to all corn silage and no alfalfa diet, we can probably save about a dollar per cow per day. But yet, in reality, even though the Spartan 2 program can do that, in reality on the farm, you do not want to have a diet of all, all alfalfa or all corn silage. We bring both together. And there again, we start looking at, should that be a 50-50? Should that be an 80-20? You need to make that decision as a dairy producer or as a nutritionist. But the point that we need to make here is that corn silage is an excellent source of feedstuffs that will bring, as Mike, Mike Hutchin said earlier, that cheapest source of energy to the ration. And so we really want to use corn silage as our foundation of the forage program and then bring in our good quality alfalfa, and then bring in our byproducts, et cetera, et cetera, to cheapen up our ration the best we can. Well, I, I skimmed over that pretty quickly. I think we can talk more about this in, in Q&A if we want to. I think if we bring up the next slide, it will lead me into introducing my, my colleague, Dr. Dick Wallace, our U of I Extension Dairy Veterinarian, who is going to visit with us on culling strategies. Dick? Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, I don't have a whole lot to uh, contribute here except for this one slide. So if we want to jump to the next slide, it's probably good that Mike only has one slide for me today because of my uh, head cold and I've been muted the whole time just so I'm not uh, coughing into the entire uh, seminar. But we're, really when we're thinking about these marginal cows, um, we need to think about what we're going to do from moving cows out that aren't profitable. So move them out of the herd if they're not producing milk. We need to really determine on a herd by herd basis what is the break-even milk yield. Is it 45? Is it 50 pounds? What's your break-even uh, milk yield for cows in your herd? And then you need to develop a strategy. Obviously, if the cow's pregnant, you're probably going to keep her around. Maybe what you need to do with that cow, if she's down below, say, a 30-pound level, is, is move her on to some kind of a lower energy diet, maybe not even a lactating diet. Dry the cow off. Uh, hopefully, she's not going to get too fat and lead to health problems later on. 
but certainly she still is a, is a valuable asset to the farm, potentially, depending, again, on how long it's going to be until she calves again. It, and it's really going to depend on how many holes you have in the herd. If you have spots to put cows uh, versus if the herd is at, at maximum capacity from a parlor standpoint, those are a lot of different strategies you need to think about, but certainly moving those those marginal cows out of the herd is certainly is another possibility to think about. One of the things that we're doing at the university is we're basically feeding our cull cows to increase their value um, as a at a later time. So we might feed them from 30 to 60 days. Now, Dr. Hutchins mentioned earlier that we need to be feeding that expensive lactating cow way back uh, back to other cows. Certainly, that's one one strategy. Uh, you know, there are some concerns possibly about biosecurity and, and if there's any fecal contamination. I don't know that we really want to be feeding that to other lactating cows from either Salmonella or a Yoni's disease, or depending on what the disease uh, diseases are in the herd. We take uh, any way back that we have um, from either the tie stall barns or from the free stall barns. And as he mentioned, uh, Travis has us feeding down to pretty much zero way back in, in the free stall lots. But any way back that we have, we end up feeding that out to our cull cows to try and increase their value. You could move them from a, a thin yellow fat cow to a white fat cow uh, that's going to bring you maybe up to five cents more per pound once she goes to slaughter. So just some strategies to think about. And I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Mike. Well, thanks very much, Dave and, uh, and Dick. Uh, this wraps up our, our formal part of our seminar. Our summary uh, looks pretty straightforward to me. You know, I, I think if, if you're going to be in this dairy business, those uh, three points we can't argue very much about at this stage of the game, and uh, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Again, if you found value in this, uh, write this date down. Uh, this is our next webinar. Dave Fisher will be leading on that. Both Dick and I will be online to be part of that one as well. You see the time. We're going to do it at noon. I understand in China that's not a very good time, but... Uh, but uh, that gentleman has all the beauty sleep he needs, I think, at this point. There's your URL. You'll be able to find that other places as well. We would certainly welcome you as far, welcome your your uh, your involvement if you uh, have that time to sneak in for one hour. As far as that goes, we also welcome you to come to our website. Uh, you can. Uh, Go there, as I said earlier, the Dairy XNet site's an excellent one as well, and you can get to us from there as well. And so uh, we welcome you to come and visit those websites. I think there's really good information there for you. So at this time, we will welcome your questions. Jim, we've got a couple of good ones already here. Any of you that want to uh, type in a question, uh, go right ahead. Uh, Jim will monitor as long as I will at this stage of the game. We had a comment from an Illinois milk uh, farmer who says, you know what, we can uh, we can make all uh, all corn corn silage work very well. In fact, I've been on this farm and they'll go almost 100% uh, uh, corn silage on their farm and of course it becomes very economical as Dave pointed out. So it's just a comment, Dave, that you do have one detractor out there and you probably even know who that crook is. If not, I, I will tell you later. No, I'm only kidding. Only kidding. Well, we had, we had well, a comment that came in uh, from a colleague uh, in Pennsylvania who said, uh, Mike, I haven't seen any data saying finely ground corn is higher than high moisture corn or steam flake, and he questions that. And I, his point is well taken. The good news is I can just say, blame it on the NRC 1989, because I lifted those numbers directly out of NRC. So uh, I, I think the point we have to make is that if your high moisture corn is too dry, if your steam flaking is, doesn't have the right density, if you're grinding your corn isn't the right particle size, you're going to lose some value. And in and, and my view, I think the finely ground corn and the steam flake corn and the, uh, and the high moisture corn are, are kissing cousins. And if you really want to play hardball, I think the real winner is steam flake corn. And I say that not because of my Pennsylvania colleague, but basically because if you look at the data that was done at, at Agway, uh, while it was not statistical, there was a little bit more kick on the, on the protein side on the steam flake corn. We had another question that came up here a bit earlier who said, uh, uh, what about this break even? Uh, the question, what do I mean by break even? And I'll answer two or three ways, and then Dave, I'll let you kick in because you had worked with one of our, with one of our co ops on this one here. One break even simply says, I'm, I'm just going to cover my, my, my cost. I'm not looking at debt retirement or principal. That looks to be around 15, 15, 50, somewhere in that range there. Ah, most of us have debts. That number I have seen from FBFM around $18 to $19 here in Illinois. Then some of you want to 
make some money on this thing, and that means you're going to be around 20. In fact, if you look at USDA, they've got the Corn Belt break-even price sitting somewhere around 20 to 21 dollars per hundredweight. So I, I think that all goes into play. So one of my students said, Hutchins, how do you get away with that crap? Then I mean, if you're only getting 12 dollars from milk, and that's what it looks like it's going to be this in for February uh, here in Illinois, and 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 the minimal cost is 15. The answer is well, you don't make three dollars for labor. You don't you don't pay yourself on that, or you have other ways. You defer some of those costs to try to get that try to get that job done. As far as that goes, okay. And Dave, any comments on that? Yes, I, I just agree. I think also then we're saying we're just actually paying cash costs and some of these other costs we're foregoing at this time when you only get the twelve dollar milk. But when we talk about that five fifteen fifty cost of production, we do have included in there certainly a, a value for the facilities, a value for the cost of the cow, but we just do not have that return on investment or that ability to pay off debt, et cetera, just like Mike said. Well, uh, David, I, I think uh, J James thinks that I've screwed up answering that question, and then I led you astray as well. He's thinking that the, the, the question may relate to that break-even price on our byproduct feeds. And that break-even price on byproduct feed is based on the five target ingredients. We're using shelled corn as an energy source, soybean meal as a source of protein and rumen undegradable protein. We're using tallow as the price for fat or oil. We're using dicalcium phosphate as a source of phosphorus, and we're using limestone as a source of calcium. And so if you've got a byproduct feed like distiller's grain that's high in phosphorus, then that adds value. Some of you on this line will say, Hutchins, you're cheating because a lot of that phosphorus is way too high already. We're having, in fact, we've got some problems with the environment about it. Well, I'm sorry, that's how the program works. So when we're, we're simply saying when you can get that feed delivered to your farm at that price that's below break even, it's a better buy than those five base ingredients. Norman St. Pierre uses a combination of feedstuffs. So instead of looking at an ingredient, he's looking at the prices of hay and corn silage, and he has a fairly, I assume, complicated system that that says a uh, cotton seed then breaks even at a certain point, but he's using feeds where we're using feed ingredients. I know there's a couple other uh, private companies have some of their internal software program. In fact, Spartan also does this, what they call shadow prices, and will give you the same kind of thing as far as that goes. Uh, David, do you want to make a comment? Uh, uh, what came in here says, what are the disadvantages of all corn silage and basically zero alfalfa diets? Well, I think one of the, the disadvantages would be Corn size brings a, a low amount of protein uh, to the diet. So unless you can bring in that protein at a reduced cost or lower cost in the form of byproducts, like you said, corn, distill distillers, or whatever, unless you can do that, then you're going to have to still go with alfalfa to bring in uh, that protein. Advantage, of course, again, the high energy. Uh, with processed corn size, we are able to maintain good effective fiber, and so, as our Illinois dairyman mentioned, he is going all corn silage, and that can be done. A lot of times I'd say an 80-20 would, would certainly maybe play it well because I like to have about five pounds of, of that longer uh, alfalfa uh, scratch factor. But again, I think the point is if you can balance that ration with good, good uh, economical byproducts to bring up my protein, you can get by with very little alfalfa in the diet. David, a uh, great answer. Uh, I just want you to know that our colleague in Illinois says, and this is interesting, he knows this number, $4.28 feed cost, I assume that's per cow per day. Uh, wow, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a really good number. Uh, he's he's going to do really well. I don't think it's per hundred weight, but respect back if it is. We had another quick question. I'll answer these quickly. I don't know, do, do other guys see these, Jim, or just me? I'm just seeing them. Here comes the question. He says, give me an example of an acid-based bunk extender. Well, certainly if uh, the, the, the easiest one to go to Kemen, not that I'm in, not that I'm being paid by Kemen Industry, but basically they have something called a uh, bunk curb. Uh, which simply is a propionic based additive and for six or eight cents you mix this into your TMR mixer and it's, it's got prop in it and it retards the secondary fermentation so it tends to keep the feed cooler for a longer period of time. I've also seen another product that has diacetate in it which is a, an acetic acid type product and that also seems to hold back the secondary fermentation. Some of you guys will put that in the top of your silos the, the top 10 feet of your side, you'll put some propionic acid in there because it doesn't pack as well and you don't want that stuff to get moldy and get hot on you as much and they'll treat the top top 10 feet, the top three or four doors of their silo to get that same thing done. 
A uh, question came in here, uh, do you have any comments or recommendation on how to maintain rumen health function to prevent acidosis uh, that can impact feed, feed efficiency? And, and boy, the, this is the kitchen sink. Uh, we, we may delay the full answer to that. We are simply saying if you have acidosis that we are expecting the feed efficiency to drop about a tenth of a point. I have no research to back that up, but we know it does impact. That means if you've got acidosis, probably that 30 cents per cow per day range is going to cost you. And we do that by such things looking at fecal consistency. We look at um, uh, dry matter variation. We, we look at um, uh, lameness scoring on cows. You could maybe use milk components, in some case butter fat, although Wisconsin people argue that's not a very sensitive test on that. But that's how I would try to do that. And then if you got acidosis, then comes the big laundry list, such things as, uh, Dave has already pointed out, uh, cud chewing, uh, such things as moisture of the ration, such things as grain levels, such things as slug feeding, such things as heat stress. All these things pop in that can have some impact on rumen function and health, and I know that list is fairly short as far as that goes. Got another quick question. We're burning through these awfully fast. When I can't answer one, Dick and Dave, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, we, we have a question that's coming. Uh, a, pro, a question comes in. It's very specific. It's, it's a product that comes from Agar King, and we answer. It's called Rumamax versus Rumenzin. Rumenzin is an antibiotic, so it actually selects against the against the gram-positive bacteria. So it's it, it, it's it's a, a microbial inhibitor. I think that did, Dick. That's how you termed it yesterday at this point. So that's what rumenzin does. It selects microbes, and that that literally will increase propionic acid, which has some efficiency built into it, and it it, it works against uh, forage digesting bacteria to a small extent. And that's why sometimes we can see some impacts in rumen health. The Rumamax product is a, of a combination of products out there. I think they have uh, they have some uh, direct fed microbials in there. I think that they have some yeast culture in there. I do not think they have rumen in there. But then again, I, I'm not that close to the product. But one is more of a rumen stimulant type product. The other one is an antibiotic. So they're, they're, they're vastly different. And if somebody wants to jump in on it, on the Rumax, they can and we can read it back. Another quick question, how much corn gluten can you feed and how much corn will it replace? My answer very simply is I got to keep my targeted starch level. And if I say that's 24%, then I'm going to target 24% starch in my diet. And I will bring in as much gluten to replace corn as I can to maintain that, that, that number. Now, if I'm feeding, uh, like my colleague in Illinois, heavy corn silage, I probably can replace all my corn with corn gluten at this stage of the game because I've got starch at 28, 30, 32, 34% starch coming from my corn silage. So basically, that's how I would go. Now, let's just be simple about it. We simply say as a thumb rule, you can replace half your corn with corn gluten. That's a pretty safe thumb rule. You can replace, in fact, last night we had a farmer in southern Illinois. I want him. He's running out of corn silage. I think wet corn gluten is a no-brainer. And so I would suggest to him that he replaces all his corn silage with wet corn gluten feed, assuming he can buy it and it's priced right, he'd be close to a resource on it. Again, watch such things as particle size because now corn silage is gone. I'm losing some particles. The whole discussion Dave had here just a bit earlier that went on as far as that goes. And um, and I uh, just have a comment. Oh, uh, we have another question. Uh, can we feed a huge quantity of corn silage in the summer? Dave, you want to re respond to that? Can I? Can we feed a huge amount of corn silage in the summer? Yes, I don't think there would be a problem with that. I think the key you have to make sure bunk life and make sure that uh, you have a lot of fresh feed out there. So maybe you'll feed two or three times a day versus one time a day. Uh, but certainly, uh, as far as palatability and intake. Uh, it would be a win-win, and I would certainly not be afraid of feeding large amounts of corn silage. Mike, any other thoughts? I, know, I think you're in good shape. The only thing I would add to it, David, is that the corn silage being very high in lactic acid is an awful nice bunk sta stabilizer. I think I can get away maybe a little bit, with a little bit less risk on secondary FEMA because i got all that lactic acid in there, so it might even help. What, what scares me is my farmer runs out of corn silage, and the temperature is going to be 70 degrees tomorrow. What a bad deal because now he takes out probably his most stabilizing ingredient in his diet and, 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 and now is replacing it with something that's not going to be nearly as stable with something that's running 5 6 7% lactic acid as far as that goes. We had two comments from two of our people online. This is kind of fun, actually. They said they're pretty confident now that that Kemen product is called TMR Saver instead of what I call a mold curb or, or bunk curb or something like that. You can see I'm getting old. I'm not staying up to date, but I got that from two different people, and I'm sure it has the same function.
function as, as far as that goes. Had another quick question that came in here about uh, whey. Um, Jim is, uh, if whey is cheap, how much whey can I feed to my fresh cows? Can it be ad libitum or, or will lead to DA? Uh, our number is that you can probably feed, uh, whey is going to be sugar, so I'm going to back into two ways. We say you can feed probably about, a, you can add a pound, a pound and a half sugar to the ration. Uh, whey, uh, lactose is obviously going to be a sugar replacement as far as that goes. So I'm saying if you start adding about 5%, 5%, that's a bunch. That's a bunch. Uh, I would add more like two to four percent, two to four percent on a dry matter base to my TMR as far as that goes. It'll go very, very quickly. Could it lead to DA if I had some acidosis? If I had my, I mean, excuse me, if my rumen was was maybe didn't have quite the fill factor, and I drop in some really fast fermentable carbohydrate. Uh, my uh, a person who asked this question, yep, I, I think I could cause some DAs just because of the rapidness of the fermentation profile. So if I had the rumen on the edge and and it's kind of like saying, well, could, could I feed too much corn? Could that cause a DA? Well, academically, no. But if it's the wrong situation, you better believe it's going to cause a DA. Same thing with the, with, with the whey. So I'd say 2 to 4%. By the way, if whey is cheap, and, and it is getting quite a bit cheaper, then I would go in and look at that also as a great additive for my haylage. If you want to put a, a, a nutrient source into haylage to make it really ferment along with your, your inoculant, ah, add about 10% whey, dried whey to it or even liquid whey and holy smokers those bacteria think they died went to heaven because they got all that sugar in there it's kind of like my, like my ED M&Ms as far as that goes our colleague that's feeding the high levels of uh, corn here in Illinois came back in and said he's feeding about uh, four pounds uh, if, if we don't feed four pounds of corn he says the manure starts to stiffen up so he says he can't replace all his corn but obviously that's a lot less than 10 12 or 14 pounds that many farmers would feed at the this point. Another quick question came in here, and I know we're running late, so some of you got to take off, uh, sign off as far as that goes. Can you feed uh, dry corn gluten feed along with two thirds haylage, one third corn size based diet, and be concerned about too much soluble protein? Yeah, I think you can. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, don't you're locking me in though because uh, two thirds haylage. You, in my view, uh, David, you can jump in with me or uh, in up here. Two thirds haylage. You almost always have too much soluble protein, and that's one reason we go to the higher corn size data, diets because we can get our muns down and we, we can bring in the right amino acids to complement uh, the profile that's coming from the microbes from the corn silage as far as that goes. So uh, I I would say yes it is, and yes uh, the corn gluten feed does have soluble protein. So the answer is yes. I understand, and now you're saying, Hutchins, you're lying through your teeth because now you're telling me I should use corn gluten because it's cheap. And so the question is, do I uh, run some environmental concerns or do I lose the farm? And I, I say that carefully. I, I don't want to get in trouble like uh, our president did, did last night on, on, on the talk show. But the point is, uh, we're going to make some decisions in the next couple of months that maybe environmentally aren't quite solid or maybe we would do, uh, if, but at this point, if I can save 20 cents a cow a day, that might be just enough to keep me in the dairy business. David, any comments on the soluble protein, looking at, at those kinds of feeds? Did you hear what I said? I heard what you said, Mike. I certainly agree with you. Nothing else to add at this point. Okay, well, I think we've got all the answers, all the questions answered at this point. It's after 1 o'clock. My apologies. Running long at this stage of the game. Jim, you've done a wonderful job. Uh, Dick Wallace and Dave Fisher, thanks very much for joining us. We thank you for the many participants that have signed in here today. Uh, great questions. We came in, and we hope we'll see some of you back here in uh, on the 8th of uh, April, April with uh, the title Looking at Dairy Replacement Hef Heifer Webinar. So until then, we're going to sign off. And uh, Jim, what's going to happen? Are we going to get an evaluation? Get okay, Jim says you're going to get a survey at the end. When you sign off, it's going to pop right up. Right. So it's not going to come an email. It's going to, so when, if you signed off, obviously you won't hear me anymore, but you're going to get a survey. It should take a minute. Oh, yeah. Take a minute, send it back to us. It's got about two or three questions we'd like to learn a little bit more about. What did you think? And man, are we signing off? So if you got a chance, give me another minute. Sign off at this stage of the game. Jim, thank you very much to you and to Luann and to Jen for your support and getting the source one out. And we'll be curious to hopefully hear how it worked out. I understand we had a couple little glitches in terms.